Welcome to the second day of the 2023 Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lectureship on Representative Government. On behalf of the Center and the Rothbaum family, I want to thank you for your attendance at this biennial event. We sponsored this lectureship to bring together scholars, students, and citizens to nurture the values of a representative democracy. Through our mission and, and in our center programs, we strive to strengthen representative democracy through engaged and informed citizens. The Rothbaum Lecture was established 40 years ago in 1983 with an endowment gift by Mr. Rothbaum's wife, Irene, and son, Joel Jankowski, who's with us today. This lecture series serves to promote ideals that Julian Rothbaum held dear in his own life and that Carl Albert Center seeks to achieve in all of its efforts. He believed most strongly that the lectureship should underscore the importance of education, which enhances the quality of participation in public affairs, the cultivation of public service and future political leaders, and the broad-based engagement of private citizens in public affairs. In addition to his successful business career, Julian made sure to give back to his state and country. He served two terms in the Board of Regents of the University of Oklahoma, and another as an Oklahoma State Regent for higher education. He and his wife, Irene, endowed professorships in the College of Arts and Sciences, in the College of Fine Arts, in the College of Law, and in the Department of History. In addition, he established student awards in honor of his lifelong friend, Carl Albert, at three institutions of higher learning, which Speaker Albert attended. Julian Rothbaum believed, as did his lifelong friend Carl Albert, that education and public service are at the heart of a representative democracy. The center is proud to host its 21st Rothbaum lecturer, Professor Francis Lee. Professor Lee is professor of politics and public affairs at Princeton University with a joint appointment in the Department of Politics and the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. She has broad interest in American politics with a special focus on congressional politics, national policymaking, party politics, and representation. She is author and co-author of five books about the US Congress, and her papers have appeared in all the top journals. Professor Lee has been awarded the Richard Fenno Prize, the D.B. Hardiman Prize two times, the Gladys M. Kammerer Award, and the E.E. E. Schottschneider Award. <clears throat> She's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was an APSA Congressional Fellow. Professor Lee earned her BA from the University of Southern Mississippi and her PhD from Vanderbilt University. In yesterday's lecture, Professor Lee taught us that although Congress is not a perfect institution, I think we also observed that over the evening, that Congress is not a perfect institution, uh, it is one that strives to be representative of the many opinions that could be found across our large and geographically dispersed country. Today, we will learn more about Congress as a lawmaking body. So please help me welcome Professor Lee for her second lecture, Policy Making a Government of Accommodation. Thanks, Mike, and uh, uh, thanks to the Carl Albert Center and the University of Oklahoma and uh, to Joel Jankowski for a sponsorship of the Julian Rothbaum Distinguished Lecture in, uh, in Representative Government. I'm just delighted to be able to be here and to offer a series of lectures. It's, it's rare to have an opportunity to uh, lay out an argument over uh, a, a series of days and, and, and get um, uh, feedback from a diverse audience like this. So uh, I appreciate you coming and thank you for uh, your, uh, your attention. Today's lecture is titled, A Government of Accommodation. My goal is to convince you today that forcing accommodation between contending political parties and interests in Congress is Congress's main role. That's, uh, that's primarily what Congress achieves in the American political system. It's a tough job in our polarized politics. It's far from perfectly achieved. Not all differences can be successfully accommodated. But without Congress, there would be a lot less working out of our differences as a society than we currently have. 
The title comes from a letter President Washington wrote to British historian Catherine Graham in 1790. In the letter, Washington describes the founding of the American constitutional system. So the establishment of our new government seemed to be the last great experiment for promoting human happiness by reasonable compact in civil society. It was to be, in the first instance, in a considerable degree, a government of accommodation as well as a government of laws. Much, would, much was to be done by prudence, much by conciliation, much by firmness. Washington's concise statement sums up a lot about the Constitutional Convention. The Convention uh, was a, a group of practicing politicians. They were not political theorists. The document that they uh, agreed to took root in some shared philosophical ideas about political representation and Republican government. But there was also a great deal of compromise and accommodation among the delegates representing states and regions with diverging interests. I like this quotation from Washington because not only does it describe the formation of the government itself, but it's also an apt description of congressional lawmaking. Now, I'm of course not suggesting that our current members of Congress can be compared with the Founding Fathers. Nevertheless, the ways in which the Constitutional Convention operated, writing a Constitution, bear some significant similarity to how ordinary legislation happens as well. As a general rule, federal laws are also typically grounded in compromise and accommodation as well. As Washington said of the Constitution, much in Congress is aimed at conciliation and accommodation of diverging interests, regions, parties. As I'll show, deals in Congress are typically inclusive. It's rare for Congress to make laws on close votes. You may doubt that conciliation and accommodation are normal features of congressional lawmaking. I'll endeavor to convince you that they are and that they are Congress's normal mode of functioning, uh, and that is um, bipartisan accommodation. As with yesterday's lecture, I'll draw on John Adams to frame our thinking of lawmaking. Adams suits our sensibilities today in that he was never a sunny thinker. Unlike with Jefferson, there's no romanticization of democracy in Adams' work. I don't think there's any of us today too inclined towards too much romanticization of American democracy either. Adams begins his thinking about political constitutions by recognizing that di disagreement is never going away. It will always be present in politics. If we stop fighting about one thing, we'll start fighting about something else. As I said, can you find a people who will never be divided in opinion, who will always be unanimous? For Adams, the sheer in inevitability of conflict is the central problem for democracy. How can we govern ourselves amidst abiding, unresolved conflict? Simple majority rule for Adams was not the answer because Adams did not trust that representative assemblies would always act in the public's interest. In his view, they were prone to folly and enthusiasms. To limit their worst impulses, Adams emphasized the need for bicameralism the need for two chambers to watch and check one another, and the need for checks and balances in a constitutional system more generally. Adams' defense of the constitutions of the government of the United States, a three-volume treatise on mixed government, primarily centers on the, ne the necessity of balancing different interests, especially in the legislature. Human beings, in Adams' view, could not and would not be fundamentally changed. For Adams, there was no way to raise the general level of virtue so that there would be no conflict, no disagreement uh, on values and interest. There was no possibility of stamping out disagreement, misinformation, polarization, disputes about interests, about values, about, e about even facts. As with Madison's answer to the problem in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51, Adams argued that we needed checking and balancing in order to restrain, uh, to restrain the excesses of, uh, uh, of simple majority rule. Assemblies needed to be restrained by opposition. 
a bicameral legislative process with multiple points of review is all about forcing, forcing these confrontations. But politics has to be about more than checking. The task for politics is to come together and to act in the face of persistent conflict. As philosopher Jeremy Waldron puts it, we must be able to disagree, but then to act, and to act in a way that maintains the loyalty of those who will, inevitably, continue to disagree. Congress must do more than represent diversity and give voice to disagreement, as we discussed uh, yesterday. It must also act. It must make choices. It has to pass laws. It has to spend money. It has to raise revenue. It has to govern. And it has to govern in ways that avoid alienating those who continue to disagree. And disagreement is never going away. Those who disagree must continue to engage, must continue to see themselves as full members of the political body. Coping with conflict is one of Congress's greatest strengths. Congress is rarely described in this way. The institution is usually presented as unrelentingly polarized. And, but although the parties in Congress do hold starkly different views on many issues, it's a misunderstanding of Congress's role to stop with that fact. One has to consider what happens next. When it turns, when it turns to lawmaking, Congress is our key institution forcing negotiation and compromise. To the extent that differences get bridged in American national government, that happens in Congress more than any place else. And they do indeed get bridged in an ongoing, always provisional way. In this lecture, I'm going to aim to give you four reasons why Congress promotes a government of accommodation, even amidst polarization. I want to start with process. Congress promotes a government of accommodation because it employs inclusive processes. Congress is better able to, able to cope with conflict, first of all, because the representative assembly openly acknowledges society's divisions. It does not paper over them. It does not ignore them. As discussed yesterday, Congress reflects the divides that exist in the country. The division of party power in Congress closely mirrors the balance between the parties that exists, between, exists in the country at large. The composition of Congress looks like what one would expect to see in a legislature where the parties are roughly at equal strength nationally. By comparison, the composition of the executive branch does not reflect the nation's divides. Nothing in American politics is as winner-take-all as the outcome of presidential elections. No matter how narrowly presidents win, their party controls the whole executive branch. And after winning, presidents will go on to assemble administrations entirely or almost entirely drawn from members of their own party. Presidents like to claim that they represent the whole American people, but most presidents win narrowly. Narrow wins are the norm in uh, our polarized 21st century. This figure displays the winning presidential candidate's share of the two-party vote over the past century. As you can see, presidents do not win by big margins. Since 1988, no presidential candidate has received more than 55 percent of the two-party vote. On average, they've won with just 51.8 percent. We've had two recent presidents who did not win the popular vote, um, George W. Bush in 2000 and Donald Trump in 2016. If we look back before 1988, you can see that uh, there's a fair number of presidents who received 60% of the vote, and a, a few more that received above 60%. But by election day 2024, it will have been 40 years since the last presidential landslide. The narrowness of these outcomes contrasts with the policy process inside the executive branch, where policymakers routinely are drawn almost exclusively from the ranks of one party. An under-acknowledged under aspect of congressional processes is that they are designed to acknowledge, respect, and give full voice to political disagreement. 
Congress contrasts with executive branch processes, which include only the voices selected by presidents and their appointees. Consider the various ways in which congressional procedure is respectful and inclusive of political differences. When legislation is debated, proponents and opponents are allocated equal time. This is true even when a party has a large majority in Congress. Right now, Congress is basically 50-50, Republicans and Democrats, so it's especially appropriate to allocate time equally, but it's just the norm. Congress's processes respect differences because the minority party gets to choose its own representatives on committees. The Democrats on the Ways and Means Committee right now, or on the Oversight Committee, are the Democrats that the Democratic Party leaders and members want to have there. They are not the Democrats handpicked by Speaker McCarthy, or former Speaker McCarthy, or the Republican Party. Committees are not always perfectly representative of the chamber. In the House, sometimes the majority party will stack the deck on some committees and give itself an outsized majority. But most committees are representative. Regardless, you don't see tokenism, where the party in power chooses its preferred minority party members to serve on the committees. Legislative processes enforce norms of respect and civility. Members may not refer to one another in a derogatory manner, nor may they attack their motives. They can criticize their opponent's statements. Members are permitted to say that another member's claim is untrue, but they cannot say that it is a lie. In debate, members do not directly address one another, but instead direct their remarks at the presiding officer. These restrictions help to keep debate focused on the merits of issues and also help to tamp down personal conflict. These norms are largely adhered to. They, there are, of course, breaches of decorum, um, but debate most of the time and even at heated moments does not devolve into accusations of bad faith and name calling. Despite Congress's poor reputation, Americans could probably learn a thing or two about civility and respect for, for differences from watching Congress. There's nothing equivalent to these norms of, of civility and respect for differences governing presidential advising processes. Some presidents are more interested in hearing full debate than others, but it's a matter of their own taste and preferences. Congress's practices around respecting differences offer a worthy model for democracy. Congress isn't special in this respect. It's what's normal for legislative assemblies. But in countries lacking a tradition of democracy, legislatures often offer a model of democratic norms. Displayed here just for point of reference is the Parliament of Armenia. In a classic comparative legislature's text, David Olson noted how the parliaments in the new democracies created after the fall of the Soviet Union showed how democratic debate and deliberation could function in an open society. He said, in newly democratic societies, parliament is the leading example of what democracy is in practice. Whatever other shortcomings congressional deliberation might have, they at least show respect for opposing points of view. Congressional processes can serve as a model for democracy to organizations outside of politics, for civil society, for universities and other settings. Maintaining open processes that respect and allow for expression of diverse views is very difficult, and many institutions struggle with it. Think about the organizations with which you are familiar. How many of them operate according to processes that give balanced weight to opposing viewpoints? The tendency instead is towards tokenism. An organization will try to call itself bipartisan by uh, selecting some token representative of the opposing perspective. You know, think about the academic panels you may have seen that are composed of three or four liberal Democrats with a token reasonable Republican. Uh, maybe a Liz Cheney or equivalent uh, in, some, uh, in some earlier eras, or Fox News panels made up of a set of conservatives and one so-called top Fox News Democrat. Congress does not work this way. There's real representation of differences, and there's not tokenism, and the minority party gets to exercise its voice. 
Finally, Congress's processes are more inclusive than those in the executive branch because of very different incentives around the need to seek bipartisan support. The executive branch operates according to what political scientist Sid Milkest has termed executive-centered partisanship. This is a broad concept, but a key aspect of executive-centered partisanship involves actively screening political appointees for ideological conformity with party goals. There's not an inclusive hearing of both sides in presidential policy processes. That's just not what the White House is set up to do. On the other hand, Congress's processes are more inclusive because members have more incentives to seek bipartisan support. We often think that this is the case because members have to anticipate the need to get through the Senate and a potential filibuster. And undoubtedly, this is true. But incentives for bipartisanship are much broader than just the Senate filibuster. If members want to get an, in, uh, an initiative through the legislative process, they are just so much more likely to succeed if they can get bipartisan support. Partisan conflict creates a lot of friction in the legislative process, slows everything down, limits what can get past that obstacle. When I did some interviews on Capitol Hill looking for perspectives on how legislative entrepreneurs can achieve their goals, over and over I was told that members need to look for a co-sponsor from the other party and that it was almost impossible to succeed any other way. In all these ways, legislative processes are fundamentally designed to express disagreement, hash it out, and cope with it the best they can. This is how the framers saw it. It's still true today, and it's quite distinct from the way the White House works. A second way in which Congress promotes a government of accommodation is that lawmaking coalitions are dominantly large and bipartisan. It's not merely that Congress's processes are inclusive and respectful of difference. Congressional outcomes are usually highly inclusive and garner broad support in the body as well. Let's look first at the size of enacting coalitions. Laws quite simply rarely get enacted on close votes. This figure shows roll call votes on the passage of bills in the House of the Senate. So these are just the roll call votes that result in the enactment of laws. The left axis shows the average number of yay votes in the House on bills that pass, and the right axis shows the number of yay votes in the Senate. These are not close votes. The average bill that becomes law passes the Senate with 77 votes. The average bill that passes the House clears with 330 votes, roughly 78% of the chamber. In other words, most of what Congress passes was acceptable to most members. Note that supermajorities are doing the legislating in the House as well as in the Senate. In fact, House lawmaking rests on levels of a lawmaker's support that on average exceed the three-fifths requirement that are that's typical in the 60-vote Senate. The picture is not different if we look only at important laws. This figure just displays the average coalition size on the dozen or so of the most important laws passed in each Congress, as designated by Yale political scientist David Mayhew you know, over, over these decades. For important laws, the average bill that becomes law passes the House with more than 312 yay votes and passes the Senate with more than 77 votes. As you can gather from the simple vote tallies, the important laws that pass get significant support from the minority party. Here's another cut at that uh, question. This figure focuses just on the important laws as designated by Mayhew. Um, the most important laws that pass get majority support from the minority party in both chambers. So these, this shows you the share of those important laws that received majority support from the minority party. A couple things uh, you can observe in these data. So House and Senate. There's, first of all, there's no trend in these data. Party conflict has been rising in Congress overall, but not on final passage roll call votes. You can see that the majority party is more likely to go it alone in the Congresses with unified party control. So you can look at 1993-94 under Clinton. 
2000 through 2004 under George W. Bush, 2009-10 under Obama, or 21-22 under Biden. So those are relatively low shares of important laws passing with a majority of the minority party. Note, though, it's, it's always a significant share of laws, even in unified uh, party, uh, party control. Take a look at Trump's first two years in office, 2017-2018. Some partisan laws got enacted, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, around a dozen Obama-era agency rules got overturned. But 83% of, 83 of the important laws that passed in Trump's first two years in office still had support from most Democrats in both House and Senate. If we set the bar for meaningful minority party support lower, at 10% or more of the minority party voting in favor, we see that very few laws don't meet this bar. This is a low bar, but it means there's more than token support from the minority party. We're talking about a block consisting of 10% of the party. It's a far, a far larger block than overturned uh, Speaker McCarthy's speakership yesterday. Uh, we're talking about um, the, si the rough size of the House Freedom Caucus now. So 10% to the minority party voting in favor. In most Congresses, 100% of important laws clear this bar and get at least 10% of the minority party voting in favor. Minority party support drops in Congresses with unified government, but never very low. Basically, a president working with unified control of both chambers of Congress can expect to get one or two important laws passed on party line votes. That's it. So George W. Bush got his tax cuts. Obama got Obamacare and the stimulus package. Trump got his tax cuts. Biden got his big COVID bill and a health care environment package. So when you see statistics about how much party conflict there is in Congress, it's very important to remember that laws very, very rarely pass with only one party in favor. Lots of bills pass the House on the basis of majority rule, but very few laws get made on the basis of party line votes. Lawmaking remains predominantly bipartisan. In my view, this reality is probably the, most, the single most important fact about how Congress operates in the party polarized era. Now you're probably asking, why doesn't Congress pass more bipartisan, pass more partisan laws? After all, parties are very different from one another. They have starkly divergent policy preferences on many issues. And today's parties are highly cohesive relative to the past. Uh, this graph shows the share of roll call votes in, House, in the House and the Senate that divide 90% of Republicans from 90% of Democrats. You can see enormous rise in the share of roll call votes that break down in that highly partisan manner. And when issues divide a majority of Democrats from a majority of Republicans, it's typical for 90% uh, uh, or more of members of each party to vote with their party's position. So they're highly cohesive. There are three key reasons why Congress doesn't pass more partisan laws. Divided government is the normal state of affairs in our closely competitive party system. Different parties have controlled Congress and the presidency three quarters of the time since 1980. In divided government, Republicans and Democrats must cooperate in order to achieve any legislative success at all. The Senate filibuster obstructs the majority party from passing legislation for which it cannot win significant bipartisan support, uh, and that's primarily relevant under conditions, or most relevant under conditions where a party has unified control, Congress and the presidency. And third, even when presidents have unified party control, they usually possess only slim majorities in Congress. Narrow majorities often cannot find perfect consensus on controversial issues. As a consequence, recent presidents have failed spectacularly on top agenda items due to a lack of intra-party consensus. Every president with unified control of national government since Bill Clinton, and including Bill Clinton, failed on one of their top agenda items due to intra-party disagreement. 
Parties don't find it easy to pass laws without any help from the opposing party. Right after he, Trump took office in 2017, Republicans took it as their first order of business to repeal Obamacare. Republicans had been campaigning against Obamacare for a decade. They had they'd easily passed a re Obamacare repeal bill while Ob Obama was still president, and Obama vetoed it. But despite devoting nine months to the effort, they were never able to muster sufficient intra-party agreement on a plan. They didn't need any Democrats to support the bill. They had unified party control, and they, would, they were able to use the budget process to get around the filibuster. But they could never get all their members on the same page. One problem was that the leadership could not get Republicans to agree to repeal Obamacare without some kind of replacement. So it became repeal Obamacare was the original slogan and what they did with their legislation that Obama vetoed. That was just a straight repeal bill. But by the time we get to 2017, it's repeal and replace Obamacare. Well, why was it replace Obamacare? Because Republicans insisted to the leadership that they would not pass uh, any repeal bill without some kind of replacement. The, there was a, a, a particular concern among the 21 Senate Republicans who represented states that had already expanded Medicaid under Obamacare. And so they wanted to know what would happen with those funding flows if Obamacare was repealed and they wanted them replaced or retained in some way. The second problem was that there was a contingent of hardliners who didn't want to support what they called Obamacare light. So leaders could never put together a replacement bill that the hardliners really liked. So Republicans were, were, the leadership of the Republican Party in Congress was caught between those two groups. The first time they tried to pass a bill out of, house, out of the House, they failed due to a lack of support. After two months, the House Republicans regrouped to pass a revised bill narrowly, 217 to 213. It's just an awful votes to spare. But the Senate was never on board with the House bill. As a last-ditch effort, Senate leaders proposed a scaled-down bill that would have dismantled only peripheral components of Obamacare, the so-called skinny repeal bill, which really didn't repeal Obamacare at all. And even that then went down to defeat in that late-night vote um, when Senator John McCain, coming back from cancer care, uh, dramatically signaled thumbs down. Or look now to um, the, uh, the, the last Congress, the 117th Congress under uh, Biden in his first two years in office. The $3.5 trillion Build Back Better package was President Biden's major policy agenda after winning unified control of government uh, in 2021. Like Republicans' repeal and replace effort, Democrats would not have needed any cross-party support to pass the bill because they could use budget reconciliation to do it. But they never achieved the full internal party consensus that was necessary to do it. Although the party's conservative contingent is not large, the Blue Dog Caucus only has a paltry, or only had in that Congress a paltry 19 members. Moderates remained pivotal in a closely divided Congress. Democrats in both House and Senate haggled for months about the overall size of the Build Back Better package and the need whether, whether and the extent to which budgetary offsets would be needed to cover its cost. Moderate Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema received much press attention for their varying demands. The difficulties extended to the House as well. Along with other moderates, Representative Abigail Spanberger of Virginia balked at the lack of clarity about deficits, and she declared that nobody elected Joe Biden to be FDR. Not even liberal Democrats agreed on themse among themselves on what policies to prioritize. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi wanted to strengthen and expand Obamacare in the package while Senate Budget Committee Chair Bernie Sanders wanted to provide vision, dental, and hearing coverage for Medicare beneficiaries. Then there were the constituency-oriented members, such as Got Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey and other members from high-tax states. They were looking to provide some tax breaks to their residents by restoring the state and local tax deduction. 
and other Democrats wanted to put that money to different use. The whole effort did not collapse entirely, like uh, Republicans' efforts to repeal and replace Obamacare. A dramatically scaled back package passed in 2022 in the form of the Inflation Reduction Act. But virtually the whole social policy agenda in the Build Back Better plan got stripped out. There was no child tax credit, no universal pre-K, no new hearing and dental benefits in Medicaid, no new subsidies for child care. The measure was primarily aimed at lowering prescription drug costs and at enhancing subsidies for clean energy. It was estimated to cost $369 billion, as in contrast to the $3.5 trillion with which they started. So it was a pale shadow of what was originally proposed. The budget reconciliation process, which you hear a lot about in our polarized era, it's the primary way in which a party with unified control can get around the need for bipartisanship. Um, it's a special streamlined Senate procedure that's time limited and therefore not subject to the filibuster. This figure displays the number of times that Congress has enacted laws using the budget reconciliation process. So you can see each Congress here along the, uh, the x-axis and on the y-axis is the number of reconciliation uh, bills that have passed. Uh, one, two, or three. Three is the most you've ever seen in, in a Congress. You could you could, in theory, pass multiple budget reconciliation packages each year. Each year you do a budget, you could do, uh, you could do a pack, you could do a reconciliation bill, and you could do more than one, depending on how you structure it. And yet, this is how many we see over the, this whole time period. I'm showing bipartisan reconciliation packages in blue, and in gray are the, the ones that passed on party line votes. Uh, many of the reconciliation enactments over the history of the procedure were actually bipartisan deals. That was especially true in the early years of the procedure's existence in the 1980s. Bill Clinton and Congress jointly created the State Children's Health Insurance Program in a 1997 bipartisan budget deal. So Republicans and Democrats come together with a budget deal to create the, the, the S-CHIP program, which insured many children uh, in Medicaid. These days, reconciliation is pri primarily used to pass a party agenda item, like the Bush tax cuts, like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, like the Inflation Reduction Act. But you can see they've become more rare. You used to see Congress routinely pass them. Now Congress uh, doesn't pass them as often. They're, and uh, you, only see them, you only see them recently in unified government. And it's lucky, a party with unified government is lucky to do them at all. We normally only see one such bill per two-year Congress. Why is that? It's for the same reasons that blocked the passage of Biden's Build Back Better and Trump's repeal and replacement effort. Even though congressional parties today are much more internally cohesive than the parties of the 20th century, they are still internally diverse enough to have trouble coming to perfect consensus on controversial issues. Even if they don't have many dissenters, they're usually enough to make agreement difficult or impossible, given narrow margins of control. A third reason why we should think of Congress as promoting a government of accommodation is that the paths to legislative success typically involve conciliation of the minority party. Most of the ways in which majority parties succeed in passing their bills is by getting some meaningful buy-in from the minority party. At this point, I'll draw on data that Jim Curry and I collected for our book, The Limits of Party. We've, uh, the book came out in 2020, and we have updated it for more recent Congresses. To gauge the success that congressional majority parties have in enacting their agendas, we compiled a list of each majority party's top policy priorities in each Congress since 1985. To do this, we would read the opening Congress speeches given by the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader. And we would also look at the bills that were inserted into the leadership reserved bill numbers. So HR 1 through 10 are generally reserved for the leadership, S 1 through 5. 
And then we just did legislative histories of each of these initiatives. There's 295 between the period of um, 1985 and the end of 2022. And our goal was to assess whether parties got most of what they wanted on the package, whether they got some of what they wanted, or whether they got none of what they wanted. In other words, a none of what they wanted outcome means no bill passed on that issue item. And then for the bills that where parties saw some success, either a most of what they wanted outcome or a sum of what they wanted outcome, we looked at how they, how they did it. Did they do it by steamrolling over the minority party or did they get some buy-in? Here's just the descriptive, uh, the descriptive patterns. Uh, we classified successful agenda items into different categories depending on the approach that parties took to getting the enactment done. Backing down means that a majority party started off with a partisan bill but eventually got minority party buy-in by backing down on their most contentious asks. In the last Congress, for example, House Democrats passed an ambitious gun control bill on the heels of two deadly mass shootings. But then in order to get the package through the Senate, had to be greatly watered down. This is the most common way in which legislation succeeds, the way in which parties, majority parties, succeed on their agenda items is by backing down off the most controversial parts of the package. A second way is just to seek broad support, meaning that from the very start, the majority party tries to write a bill that will um, be acceptable to the um, opposing party. In the last Congress, for example, House Democrats um, uh, wanted to adjust drug patents so as to increase access to lower, um, to lower cost generic drugs. This was a Democratic priority that passed in 2020, even though Republicans controlled the Senate and Trump was president. They worked out an agreement on, gen on, on generics that Republicans could accept, and there was never a lot of partisan conflict about it. All the large COVID aid bills that passed in 2020 also look like this. This is the second most common way in which a majority party gets a win. To log roll means that there was some kind of trade between the two parties so that they each got something that they cared about. It's not a common path, but it does happen. A nice example of this was the 21st Century Cures Act that passed under Obama in divided government after the 2014 elections. Uh, Democrats wanted a big increase in funding for cancer research, and it's Vice President Biden's cancer moonshot. Republicans wanted to streamline approval processes in, uh, in the FDA. So they just took a trade, a lot of cancer money for streamlined FDA approval procedures. Both parties got something they wanted, and they put together a package that could get bipartisan support. A steamroll means that a majority party wanted to achieve a goal and managed to do it despite sustained minority party opposition. So think Obamacare, think Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, think Inflation Reduction Act. As you know and just saw from the data on passage coalitions, this is an uncommon pathway to success. Only about 14% of all majority party agenda items uh, where the parties succeed follow this pathway. Under certain conditions, parties can get a win like this, but they are unusual. Given how hard it is for Congress to do anything on a partisan basis, it's not all that unusual for a minority party in Congress to emerge with a lawmaking outcome that it sees as a big win. Here's Mitch McConnell, uh, Senate Republican leader in the minority, taking credit for the big omnibus bill that passed in December 2022 uh, when Democrats had unified Democratic control. So McConnell said, I'm pretty proud of the fact that with a Democratic president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate, we were able to achieve through this omnibus spending bill essentially all of our priorities. Here's House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries taking credit for keeping the government operational this past weekend when Congress passed a continuing resolution at existing funding levels. Here's Kevin McCarthy claiming credit for the same thing. Passing a continuing resolution is not an impressive legislative achievement, to be sure, but this kind of provisional bipartisanship is how Congress operates on big items and small almost all the time. 
A fourth and final way in which Congress promotes a government of accommodation is that public opinion towards Congress is not party polarized. Congress is not a beloved institution. But at any given time, Republicans and Democrats do not diverge sharply in their views of Congress. So even though Congress isn't popular, it's also not polarizing. This conciliation is especially important now, given how evenly Republicans and Democrats are matched in the national electorate. In a country where we have excruciatingly close presidential elections, cycle after cycle, we need the Congress to help counterbalance the ferocious polarization around the winner-take-all presidency. This fact about the institution is evident across multiple indicators and over a long time frame. First, take a look at job approval of Congress. So this graph displays the difference between Republicans and Democrats in their approval of presidents on the left and on their approval of Congress on the right. So just subtract Republicans' approval rating of the institutions from Democrats' approval rating of the institutions. So we just see the difference. You can see presidents are hugely polarizing. The party not in control of the executive branch strongly disapproves of the president. And this pattern has gotten extremely stark since the year 2000. Republicans loved Trump. Democrats loathed him. Democrats loved Obama. Republicans loathed him, etc. Congressional job approval just doesn't vary that much by party. Now, granted, it's slow. But Republicans are slightly more approving of Congress when Republicans are in control, and Democrats are slightly more approving of Congress when Democrats are in control. But the divide is not very deep. You see the same pattern if you look at the data on so-called feeling thermometers, in which the public is asked to rate their feelings towards institutions of government on a scale from 0 to 100. And this graph traps, tr tracks the gap, the partisan gap in feelings towards the major institutions of national government. I'm just subtracting the average Republican thermometer rating from the average Democratic thermometer rating for each of the inst major institutions of national government. We look at the partisan gap in feelings towards the executive branch, it's absolutely huge. Republicans and Democrats have very divergent feelings about the president based on their partisanship. The Supreme Court has become persistently and rather deeply unpopular among Democrats. The Congress just ticks along. It's not beloved, but not polarizing. At the last measure in 2020, there was just no difference at all between the parties in how warmly they felt towards Congress. See the same pattern when examining partisan differences in public confidence in the major governing institutions. There are big swings increasingly big swings in public confidence when party control of the presidency changes hands. Democrats have extremely low confidence in Republican presidents. Republicans have extremely low confidence in Democratic presidents. See, the swings for Congress are not nearly as wide. Yale political scientist Steve Skoranek termed presidents the lightning rods of American politics. These data on public opinion bear that out. Presidents are polarizing, and Congress isn't polarizing in a comparable way. And that probably stems fundamentally from how Congress operates. Bills usually become laws in Congress only when they win significant bipartisan support, and they rarely pass Congress any other way. All right, but does Congress get anything done? In a body where it's hard to get things done without broad consensus, gridlock is the obvious concern. Paralysis is the traditional threat to a legislative assembly. One hears a lot of complaints about gridlock, and, but they tend to be wielded by people with a partisan ax to grind. There's usually something they want Congress to do, but Congress isn't doing it. So you see many more complaints about partisan gridlock if you read the editorial page of the New York Times when there's a Democratic president than when there's a Republican president. They don't, they're le a lot less worried about gridlock in Congress when Republicans are president. There are unquestionably many issues on which the parties are mired in mutual stalemate, where bipartisan disagreement is just out of reach. But partisan disagreement is not a technocratic problem that can be solved by institutional tweaks. It's a fundamental problem of our politics. 
and neither party has a clear majority in American politics. And neither party has a sustainable majority on the rare occasions that one party has unified control. It usually lasts one Congress, and then they're back to divided government. So I'm reluctant to conclude that because Congress hasn't balanced the budget or hasn't figured out what's due on climate change, to conclude that that's a technocratic problem of gridlock. The, the problem is that the parties disagree about what to do, and the public does not know what it wants on these questions. It doesn't have a strong opinion on how to solve these problems either. If we step outside what either party wants Congress to do and just ask ourselves whether Congress is failing as an institution in ways that go beyond disappointments for one party or the other, in this regard, the evidence for gridlock is far from conclusive. So this data, this, this chart shows uh, data on two axes. One you can see in teal, the number of laws enacted over time. And you can see that the number of laws that Congress passes, and that laws that's shown on the right axis, number of laws that Congress has passed, passes has come down a lot. Many fewer laws passed in recent Congresses than in Congresses in the 40s and the 50s. However, look at the purple line showing the number of pages, total pages of statutes enacted in Congress uh, each over each two-year period. It has, it's not come down. It's still just as high as it was in the 80s and was higher than it was in the 70s and the 60s. So the sheer volume of legislation has not declined in the polarized era. It's just that we have a lot more omnibus legislating. The gridlock narrative is exaggerated. The, the, the polarized Congress is not evidently less legislatively active than the Congress of the 20th century. There's been a lot of new national policy enacted in recent years, but there's just little policy making where Congress couldn't reach bipartisan agreement. Take, for example, Congress's actions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Congress enacted a colossal amount of legislation for a sense of the scale of these expenditures, this figure compares COVID aid expenditures in 2020 and 2021 in inflation adjusted terms to uh, spending authorized in the 2009 Recovery Act, which was to that point the largest uh, uh, stimulus package Congress had ever passed, or the New Deal, the, to the total cost of the New Deal in inflation adjusted terms. In both 2020 and 2021, Congress authorized more expenditures than the 2009 Recovery Act and the whole New Deal combined. Pandemic aid expenditures were roughly equivalent to what the United States spent on war production in 1943. It's hard for me to see the case for gridlock coming out of the pandemic at any rate. Congress's COVID response is arguably the boldest set of actions ever taken in domestic policy terms. And the pandemic, um, it was not the only area of uh, bipartisan uh, ag agreement on major legislation in the 116th Congress of 2019-2020. Um, that Congress also passed an important energy and environment bill, which was to that point the most important such bill that Congress had passed. It passed the largest parks and conservation package in decades. It ratified a new trade agreement with Mexico and Canada and that was one, a, a trade agreement that labor supported, which is quite a remarkable achievement. And it instituted paid parental leave for, for, for federal civilian workers. First two years under Biden continued with a frenzied lawmaking pace. It was kicked off with the American Rescue Plan, which is a vast aid package only exceeded by the CARES Act in 2020. Congress passed a major infrastructure uh, authorization package a huge science and technology com competitive competitiveness law, the Chips and Science Act, massive Ukraine aid package. Then it managed to pass another big reconciliation bill, the multi-billion dollar Inflation Reduction Act. Congress is gridlocked on many issues that divide Republicans from Democrats, but recent Congresses have shown themselves capable of considerable policy activism on large items and small, and most especially in response to widely perceived crisis. 
I move to wrap up with a photo here of a Four Corners meeting of President Biden with the bicameral, bipartisan leaders of Congress. Uh, when we had a full set last, there's uh, Speaker McCarthy, uh, Democratic Leader uh, Jeffries, Senate Majority Leader Schumer, and uh, Republican Leader McConnell. These meetings, the Four Corners meetings, are how big decisions about domestic policy get made under conditions of divided government. The, these kinds of meetings and all the staff work and all the coalition building behind them routinely handle the major deals that have to get done, such as the omnibus appropriations packages that are necessary to keep the government functioning and, under these conditions. These are not easy negotiations, and there's often a fair bit of posturing and brinkman, brinkmanship. Yet when I see a picture like this, I always think to myself, isn't this fundamentally what you want in a country that's divided down the middle on political issues and where one party controls one institution of national government and another party controls another institution of national government? Now, these big deals are often not popular. But they will pass by wide margins, just like most everything else that passes Congress. It would be better if we had broader societal consensus on what to do on major challenges facing American government and, and society. But in its absence, in the absence of big consensus, Congress helps us to knit us together to do the things that we can all largely agree to do. Congress gives us a government of accommodation. Or to put it differently, it forces a government of accommodation. Recall John Adams' suspicion that virtue would ever serve as a constraint. In Congress, ambitious politicians accommodate one another because that's what it takes to succeed legislatively. Most of the time, Congress operates as a break on partisanship. Parties are rarely capable of steamrolling their way to victory. Often this is because they are uh, blocked procedurally by a veto, by the other chamber, by a filibuster. It's often because they can't all get on the same page on what to do. Regardless, Congress usually only passes laws that can garner broad support. Despite these constraints, Congress gets a fair bit of legislating done anyway and does so every Congress. And it does so in a way that does not polarize the public in the way that presidents do. I would argue that this kind of accommodation and conflict resolution is arguably what's most needed in a polarized country where neither party commands majority support most of the time. And this is Congress's great strength. It is messy. It is far from a model of bureaucratic rationality. But what Congress is good at doing is arriving at acceptable political settlements. Thank you. I'd be glad to take your questions. So I, I understand your point about when um, <clears throat> bills will become law. We have large majorities. Uh, we have lots of other bills that pass one chamber, but not the other, perhaps closer. Do you think members are always voting sincerely uh, when they're voting on legislation? Or do you think sometimes they are maybe don't want their fingerprints, perhaps, on something that's not going to move forward? Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I do think there's a tendency to be a little naive about the bills that passed the House and thinking that because a bill came out of the House and then gets blocked in the Senate, that's all because of the Senate filibuster. You know, you often see, that, see those statistics piled up. All these bills passed the House, but they're blocked in the Senate. Your sincerity question, I think it'd be a lot harder to pass some of those measures out of the House if there was any danger of them becoming law. Um, it's like, you know, it was easy for Republicans to repeal Obamacare when Obama was still president and would veto it. 
You know, it's position taking. You know, we want to we want to take a bold stand. We really haven't worked out all the details on this, um, but we want to show the American people that we're listening, that we, um, you know, our heart is in the right place. We're trying. We're fighting. Um, but they really haven't solved the, the legislative problems in a serious way yet, and they're expecting the Senate to block them. Uh, so I think you have to be cautious in your interpretations of what it means. There's a lot of buck passing in a bicameral system, uh, and so not to take it all um, entirely literally um, in, 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 in interpreting um, what these outcomes mean. Your question, your question also asks about fingerprints. And one thing that's nice about these big bipartisan deals is that there's a lot of political cover provided by those. It means that the opposing party can't really run against you because they voted with you on it. And so it's some, it takes it out of politics a bit. It makes it safer. And so members are seeking cover in, and protection in passing legislation in, a, in a, a, a big bipartisan coalition in this way. So. Um, fantastic presentation uh, to begin. I enjoyed it. Um, a lot of time was spent on what Congress is getting done as sort of a demonstration of um, this accommodation principle. I'm curious if there's data or if it's even possible to collect data on what's not being done, because mm -hmm. I kind of want to see it in relation to what's not being done. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that I'm sure you could collect data on. So, for example, failed bills track throughout history, mm -hmm. but some of it like a chilling effect almost mm -hmm. of members not introducing legislation because they know we're in a hyper-partisan um, environment and it's not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wonder if there's any data or any, any study that, that you are aware of that sort of compares sort of what's not being done to what is actually being done. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great question. And of course, it's a real difficulty in studying congressional performance because what do you compare it to? Uh, uh, Sarah Bender has done work on this. She's a scholar at the Brookings Institution and also at George Washington University. And the way she approached the question is to look at issues that are raised repeatedly on the uh, editorial page of the New York Times, to track that over decades, and to see which share of those got addressed legislatively. And uh, 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 using those data, she shows an increasing share of such um, uh, agenda items fail, fail to get passed in Congress. So she shows increasing gridlock by that measure. That it may be that in a country that is growing, has been growing in population, growing in economic complexity over this whole time period, that the demands on Congress are greater. Then co Congress may have sort of a carrying capacity. If I go back to uh, the wrong direction. Um, if we go back to this slide, um, slide here on total amount of pages enacted, I, you know, I, there may be a ceiling as much as Congress can possibly do in a Congress, and we may be kind of close to it. I mean, it's, what happened in 29, 2020, that's the most we've ever seen uh, in terms of uh, pages of legislation. But that doesn't mean that uh, it wasn't still the case that an enormous number of important issues in American society and economy were still left un unaddressed. Uh, that we, you know, we're putting a lot of pressure on a legislative institution to govern a country of 330 million people. And so I think that may be part of the frustration that we feel. But Congress is doing a lot, at least uh, viewed in his historical terms. Again, th thank you for your presentation. It's very outstanding. I really enjoyed all the points made. I want to kind of follow up on that question that was just asked, but from a different angle maybe. You uh, identified a number of processes within Congress that you thought gave meaning to the minority party and to the majority party so that people really were players with each other as opposed to tokenism. And I wondered if, if you have some ideas or suggestions or there are some somewhere where those processes could be even further enhanced so that uh, it seems to me that the processes you've identified do accommodate a social accommodation, which gets you to a widespread common denominator, which becomes law. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily get you to the most important questions facing the country. It doesn't necessarily get you to the issues that really uh, 
continues to divide the country. And maybe, the, maybe processes within Congress could be enhanced that would create incentives to tackle those problems that are more difficult. Mm -hmm. Do you have suggestions on that or have you thought about that? Thank you for the question. Uh, Congress in itself has been struggling with that, with that problem. Uh, if you listened to the debates during the long deadlock over uh, the election of the Speaker at the start of this Congress, many of those debates were focused specifically on con congressional processes and on the frustration that individual members feel that they're not able to have the impact that they want to have, that too many decisions are being made in those closed-door meetings, those four, in many cases those four corners meetings, the leadership offices, and that individual members don't don't feel that th their voices are being heard the way they want. And so it w I, I thought that that whole debate, I mean, it was um, uh, humorous at times, you know, the continued deadlock and the renomination of the same candidate over and over. But the debate itself was educational about frustrations around congressional processes where vo people were able to voice their critiques. And they had a lot of merit. And interestingly, even though it tended to be some of the Freedom Caucus hardline Republicans who were, uh, who were uh, taking the lead in raising these issues, it was a fair bit of bipartisan agreement on what the points that they were making about how Congress is operating. So although I was, I was praising Congress for its inclusiveness, comparing it to the executive branch, which is not terribly inclusive, uh, or comparing it to other settings with which you are familiar, where it doesn't really seem like both sides are being heard. Congress is better than those seats at low bar. But it does not operate in an ideal manner, and there's a lot of frustration among members about how Congress is working, and they want to go back to what they call regular order, uh, which allows for more open debate and amending than they currently have. So if uh, the Senate were to have a hearing on the subject of eliminating the filibuster, and you were asked to testify as to what you think the consequences of that would be given the data that you've collected, what would you be inclined to say? I would say that the filibuster is an important restraint on the majority party in unified government, that it has, an, it has important effects, but that we exaggerate it. That if you think that getting rid of the filibuster will solve all the problems of uh, you know, uh, congressional deadlock, stalemate, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, part of this goes back to my response to Mike's question that th it, in many cases it's easy to pass a bill out of the House just because you know it's not becoming law. Because, so you're not at risk of being held accountable for this partisan bill that you passed for position taking purposes. So what would happen then is if there's no filibuster you couldn't, you wouldn't have that uh, escape hatch. Um, in the House, and so the House would expect that measures that get reported out of the House would have a more viable chance in the Senate, so there'd be more caution there. Uh, and what you see, I mean, I think it's very instructive to look at that case study, which I spent a good bit of time on in the, in the, in the lecture, looking at what happened with Obamacare while Obama was president versus what happened with Obamacare once Trump was president and you had unified control. That it's easy to pass it when it was not uh, in danger of actually happening. Very difficult to pass when it's real legislation. You had um, Senator, uh, uh, House Member Representative Joe Barton saying, you, you know, this is live ammunition in this case. You know, this is not fantasy football anymore. Is this real? Uh, and in that case, it's, um, it's, uh, it's real um, uh, and you'd be held accountable. And so there's more, le more caution. And so... I, I think you have to weigh all of those considerations in as you think about what effect getting rid of the filibuster would have. Parties find it easy to agree on position taking and difficult to agree internally on real legislative, when there's real legislative stakes. And so you'd see more intra-party intra fighting uh, in unified control which is that's exactly what we see. When you give a party unified control, what happens? Make a lot of news for all the internal fights they're having uh, because it, they haven't actually worked out 
um, a, a lot of important policy matters that don't have to get worked out when you're just taking positions and passing bills that you know uh, aren't really going to become law. So just a cautionary note, I don't want to say the filibuster is unimportant, it's very important, but it's not as important. It does not end all and be all of bi congressional bipartisanship. There are many other forces that push Congress to be bipartisan in the way that it is. And most state legislatures are pretty bipartisan as well. Uh, uh, that um, uh, single party lawmaking has risks for lawmakers everywhere and they prefer to have political cover that bipartisanship provides. Thank you for your talk. It was very illuminating. I have two questions. One is, and they're both definitional. So when you were speaking about steamrolling and um, Congress itself being conciliatory. I wonder in situations in which you've got the veto, it's really not Congress being conciliatory, right? It's the president acting as the, the, the check. So would your situations where there are, um, the, the bill otherwise would pass but for the veto, wouldn't that be an example of steamrolling then? It's, it's, it's Congress, right, mm -hmm. going full steam ahead, but the president stepping in. Mm -hmm. um, and my second question has to do with your productivity slide. So um, would you consider it productive if legislation were, uh, uh, numerous legislation were passed, just merely to repeal a bill, right, or a prior law. It seems so much easier to take an eraser and erase than it is to write something. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder if your data would change if we change the definition of, you know, what is productive. Lots of repeal bills, is that productive? Thank you. Those are, those are great questions. So the question about the, the president's role in blocking steamrolls. It does happen, but a lot less than historically. You know, the veto has become less frequent. Uh, and that's largely because the, the filibuster has become more important. And so the president's co-partisans in the Senate will block, um, uh, will block the Senate from passing using the filibuster. So that then the president is spared the duty of having to veto. So it's just a, you know, one check sort of replacing another. Uh, in many cases. So the veto is less prevalent in contemporary politics than it had been. Um, but um, uh, the, your point is taken. I would also go back to the, the question about passing legislation when you know it's not going to become law. There's some position taking there, too, where Congress, and this happens in state legislatures sometimes, too, where a legislature will pass a measure that it knows the executive will veto to define differences between the parties. And that's not serious legislating there either. If you're anticipating the veto and you pass it just for, for show, then the, it, it shows the challenge of you know, trying to discern legislative intent just from looking at what Congress does or, or, what, or, or what happens uh, in various stages um, in the legislative process. On your question about um, uh, productivity and repeal bills. There's been, there's been some scholarship tracking repeals over time. It's not a large share of legislation. It's not an increasing share of legislation. And I think that the Obamacare repeal case is instructive in some ways because after a law has been in place for a while, a lot of practices, interests build up around it. And so then just erasing it is very difficult too. Uh, that uh, uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear Democrats say um, gridlock is easier for Republicans because Republicans are not trying to pass as much. They're not trying to address social problems. But the thing is, a lot of Republicans would like to repeal a lot of regulatory policies, um, but they find it's very difficult to do. Uh, and they're faced with all the same constraints in the legislative process that Democrats looking to expand social welfare programs are faced with. Uh, so it, it cuts both multiple ways. So at this point, you've mentioned sort of the unserious legislating, drawing divides between parties. Is that necessarily a good thing in terms of congressional productivity? If we're spending significant time saying, "I look how different I am from the other party," mm -hmm. is that would you consider that a waste of congressional time, or do you think that serves like a useful purpose in Congress? 
Well, it doesn't serve um, uh, a, uh, a, a very useful process in legislative terms. It can, it can be a helpful stage of working out disagreements. You know, Congress has a long timeline. It differs from the executive branch in that way. You know, presidents are in a hurry. They have a four-year term. They can get reelected once. You know, members of Congress, they, put, they make their careers there, and, and it often will take a decade to get something big done in Congress, and that's just how, how Congress operates. So some of this is just sort of necessary. Uh, the waste of time. Uh, there's a lot of wasted effort in a legislative process. Coalition building is tough, um, and you've got sometimes it's a matter of chipping away uh, at your opponents, getting them to see the merits of your perspective. So I don't want to be too dismissive, but there is, a, there is gamesmanship in passing uh, non-serious or messaging bills, and they do a lot of that. Um, to put it in a more favorable light, you'd say, well, uh, there is uh, representation going on when that occurs, and so that's another function of Congress that we can think about uh, in relation to that activity. Um, I was I was curious, like, why there were um, an increase in the number of omnibus builds that are occurring over time. Like, is it is is it more efficient, or does it like decrease the chance of them getting repealed because it's so difficult to repeal them, or mm -hmm. do they become less less re repealed? Like, as someone that's like passing a law and like something that I really really believe in. Um, would I not want it to be repealed in the future? Mm -hmm. Is that why there's so many being passed? Or? No, because um, you could repeal any part of an omnibus bill, so it doesn't protect it from, it, it, by rolling a measure into a larger omnibus package, doesn't protect it from future repeal. Why do they do it in omnibus packages? It's, it's the, the, um, the contemporary Congress, the high levels of partisanship that we see, that's a lot of friction, very difficult. And oftentimes, it's the end of the Congress that they figure out what it is, what the big deals are, and they pass it all in one handful, set of bills. Set of big bills at the end of the Congress is what you're seeing in recent Congress. Oftentimes, they'll do it even after the elections in the lame duck period. And so if you pass it in these big measures, it's safer for everybody because there may be some stuff in there that some of your constituents wouldn't like. But you're able to say, well, but this was a big package, and most of it, you know, was a good idea, and maybe there was some stuff in there that I didn't like, but, you know, I had to make a judgment call. And so you get protection from accountability in those big packages. They are very problematic um, in terms of congressional deliberation. You know, a lot of uh, deliberation is happening to the extent that it's happening behind the scenes. It's not transparent to the public when you have these big omnibus packages. It's also impossible for the news media to digest. I think this is one of the reasons why people think Congress is totally nonproductive, uh, because they pass these big packages, and there's never enough time to actually explain to the American people what just happened. Um, and then they're on to the next controversy, and so people don't realize um, the significance of the legislation that occurs because it happens most of the time Congress is fighting. And in a few moments they pass some giant bills <laughs> that then are never properly uh, dissected for the public, and so there's a gap, a gap of understanding and accountability there. What do you think of the argument um, by Herbert Crowley and then by Hal and Moe that Congress is doomed to be too local, too uh, connected to particular constituencies, and that only presidents can address national problems? I, um, maybe I even have a slide. Uh, let's see if I... I may have, I deleted them. I, I had a Moe and Howell slide <laughs> that I, I, I clearly took it out of the talk. Um, uh, I, um, I find there's some irony in their book, Relic, coming out right before the Trump presidency, that, that you know, that so you want to rest American government on a single individual um, in a, in a system where, you know, open nominations and you never, you, it's hard to know what, faction might potentially take over a party and then wind up uh, controlling the whole executive branch. You know, do you, do you want a system that's more like Latin America 
Um, I mean, that's what, that's what you're talking about. A weaker Congress and a stronger president is more like the Latin American democracies. I, you know, as you can probably gather from the talk I just gave, I'm pretty thoroughly skeptical that that is the way we want to go um, in American democracy. And I think that the broad consensus building that Congress requires is a strength. And Congress's ability to work things out and to, to, to arrive at accommodations that command broad support, uh, that tamps down conflict. You know, Congress, even though we don't love Congress and we find it very frustrating, is a ballast in the system. And you, know, you see the wild swings of public attitudes towards executives. My inclination is not to empower them further. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think there must be some process for carrying over conversations from one session to the next. Uh, so uh, uh, you can discuss if you want uh, the question that I mentioned yesterday uh, and how it relates to the role of the executive in Congress uh, as far as the big legislation. But the question I have is um, the uh, unions have been in the news almost as much as the speakership. What role do they play in Congress legislation. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're talking labor unions and the, the uh, high levels of labor unrest that we've seen uh, in the past year, year, two years in the wake of high inflation. Is that, do I understand correctly? I, oh, I mean, yeah. over the course of the 20th century, if you want. Oh, so, big, so bigger. I mean, labor unions are an important stakeholder in the Democratic Party. Uh, and that's primarily their influence, the way they have influence in national politics now. Uh, you, if, you go, if you go back 20 years, there was a larger constituency in Congress of Republicans who were friendly to labor. But the, the parties have polarized more on labor issues so that Democrats are more the vehicle by which labor unions achieve the accommodations they get in national government. And um, Republicans uh, don't rely on support from, from labor uh, to, um, uh, uh, to the same degree that they did. I wonder if we're starting to see a little change on that front. You know, uh, looking at some of the positioning of some recently elected Republicans like Eric Schmidt, Missouri, or J.D. Vance uh, in Ohio, a little bit more rhetoric friendly to labor. Uh, so maybe we can, see, we can expect to see some depolarization on labor issues going forward, but just some inklings of it. It's not clear exactly where, where that's going to go. But it's an important uh, part of the story of uh, the sorting out of the parties that we've seen that, uh, uh, and the rise of, of a party conflict in Congress is that uh, uh, labor does not provide much support, or much, Republicans do not rely on labor for much support to get elected, whereas Democrats do. What do they rely on? Then? What do Republicans rely on? I mean, we can look at their constituencies of support. I mean, non-college educated white voters is the strong, are the strongest Democrat, uh, demographic for Republicans. Um, and so there's a lot of working people who support Republicans, even if labor unions don't. Um, so uh, it, it, there's a lot of puzzles there in terms of how to interpret or understand the differences between the parties um, with respect to working people, even if the differences with respect to labor unions are really clear. Most of your comments have been re related to legislation and not as much on oversight. Uh, do you want to comment on whether or not you think Congress has, is doing an appropriate level of oversight, an inadequate level of oversight, or too much oversight? And what are the tools that Congress ought to be using when you have executive branch incompetence at the border or some other issue that's mm -hmm. ridiculous? If you are able to come back to my talk tomorrow, that's the, the subject of my talk tomorrow. Is ex <laughs> so I invite you to come back tomorrow. I don't actually offer a clear answer to your question of is it enough uh, oversight. Um, I, I, I have mixed feelings on that. I would say there's still a lot of oversight that goes on. There's far more oversight under conditions of unified government than under, I mean, under divided government 
divided party control than under unified control. And so there's some concern about whether we have enough oversight under conditions of unified party control and whether we have an excess of oversight and too much just throwing whatever at the wall to see what sticks in divided government. Um, so it's hard to answer that. We, it, you know, it's hard to benchmark. It's a little bit like the question of gridlock, like what should Congress be doing? But I will show tomorrow that unified governments, even now in, polar, in the polarized Congress, still do meaningful insight, oversight, and it has a big impact. You know, those uh, oversight hearings in unified government are sort of admissions against interest. And even though there are fewer of such hearings, they, um, they impress the public more for what they reveal. So uh, it still happens. It's still an important part of Congress's functioning in our political system. Uh, we're experiencing a typical Oklahoma weather of events. Um, I've been told if you want to, I, I think it's just rain, correct? Do you want to light it right now? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, if you do want to wait out some of the weather, uh, we ask that you do it down here in the auditorium um, and not upstairs because there's a class taking place upstairs and if you're all in the lobby, you're going to disturb the class. So up to you all. If you want to hang out, that's fine. Uh, and then if you're staying for dinner, I think I believe 6 o'clock, we can move over to the dinner, but they're still setting up. Uh, so there's that. So let's uh, thank Professor Lee for today. Thank you.